I met the Beatles. Now, I didn't know them, really, but I knew the drummer. This drummer was Tommy Moore. Now, he used to work at Garston Docks on the railway with me. He was older than the Beatles, and he did suffer at the hands and he came, of the Beatles, especially John Lennon and Paul McCartney. My fourth meeting with them was in the Jacaranda in December 60, when I met two Beatles in the Jacaranda. And they explained to me that they had been to Hamburg and this and the other had happened. So I was then with a promoter called Brian Kelly, and I said, uh, half an hour spot at Liverpool Town Hall as an, as an extra. And they agreed to it, and we fought over the fee with what, Kelly. What was it? Well, I asked Brian Kelly for eight pounds, and he collapsed, uh, and he said four pounds. I said, well, there's five of uh, There were five Beatles, you see. Actually, Neil Aspinall was a kind of Beatle. He drove them around. Anyway, after a lot of argy-bargy, it became six pounds. Now, uh, because I was handling that show, the order of the groups, I was able to give them a very good spot, not a, an early spot, you see, and not a late spot. I gave them a, a middle-of-the-bill spot. And, of course, they were, they transfixed the audience, and that was the beginning of what was later to be coined, not by me, as Beatlemania. Now, of all the Beatles, Stuart Sutcliffe, we used to talk, not just rock and roll, we used to talk about films, books, uh, paintings, he was a, uh, as you appreciate, he was quite a painter. Well, it, it was really more close to his heart than the, the guitar was, the music. Uh, uh, Stuart wasn't a meek and mild person, you know. He, he could be quite uh, verbally aggressive. So he used to stick up for himself, because uh, John, when he was in the mood, and Paul... Uh, they used to shout him down, you see. It wasn't a falling out. It was simply uh, an establishment of, uh, uh, of position, of uh, pecking order. Now, uh, lots of things had happened to them, because uh, Epstein was uh, with them, and lots of uh, glowing things uh, were going to happen to them. And in a way, they were rather full of that. Uh, in other words, they had rather got out of any emotional feelings for Stuart by then. They'd been uh, coming and going between uh, Liverpool and London. They'd been away on tours around the country. Throughout 63, uh, they actually departed Lock, Stock and Barrel from Liverpool at the end of 63, when uh, Epstein uh, set up a shop in London where all the publishers and television people are, really. And, of course, he was preparing for your Feb 64 invasion. They had been extremely big in this country, but they rather swept the significance of Kennedy's death in this country. So it seemed a logical step that America would take to them. But, of course, I had no idea that the America would be uh, swept off its feet. I always Lennon's complaint, and George Harrison was always concerned about uh, his guitar breaks, you see. Uh, and they, Paul McCartney used to say, go through the motions, and they, indeed, they, that's all they did. Few true Beatles fans have anything on Patricia Daniels besides enjoying the incalculable boon of being born in Liverpool at the same time as her heroes. She often used to see them as teenagers, fast asleep on city buses, drinking too much lager in the local pubs, and best of all, regularly assaulting audiences with the wittiest, raunchiest rock and roll ever made at the famous Cavern Club. A veritable giant of a man, Calvin Club doorman Paddy Delaney spoke to me about his days with the Beatles back in Liverpool in 1983. Here's what he had to say. Well, um, their appearance on the scene uh, occurred 
On the 21st of March, 1961, the first one I saw was George Harrison, who ambled down the street. And um, in them days, her styles were very strict and very tidy, as it's worn by teddy boys. His hair was um, lank, hanging down onto his uh, collar. He was very scruffy. That's a word for it in this country. He looked very trampish and very hungry looking. He ambled down the middle of the street and um, for a moment, I didn't think he was coming into the cabin club, but uh, I stopped him and um, asked him if he was a member. And uh, I knew he wasn't, but I know that I'd stop him anyway. But he said, no, he was with the Beatles. And I knew the Beatles were on that particular night. I couldn't do anything about it, I just had to let him in. But what I did notice, he was wearing jeans, and um, we'd banned, well, I'd banned jeans from the club. About 15 minutes later, Paul McCartney ambled down the street with uh, John Lennon in close pursuit. Paul McCartney was carrying his bass guitar, John Lennon, hands dug deep in his pockets, ambled after him. And, um, I had an idea that I might have been the same because he had the same sort of hairstyle. I let them in, and a, a while afterwards, a taxi came down the street, and uh, sitting in the back was this chap um, I later knew was, as uh, Pete Best. He was carrying the Beatles' uh, two speakers. He had his set of drums, series of wires and everything, and... Um, took him downstairs and he paid the taxi. Now this is how the Beatles arrived, first arrived at the Cabin Club. In later years when I saw groups arriving at the Cabin Club with um, like big furniture removal vans, two of them and about ten men running around moving equipment for four or five people, I realized that the Beatles actually came from nothing, they came from the earth. And also master music, the music was earthy. Also the, the animal magnetism that they had, they, it was all, uh, all encased in that one particular moment. They had this thing that uh, if you don't like me, it's just too bad. Uh, I'll say no more about it, but I'll tell you this. I saw the gradual build up from that first meeting up to the stage where a toilet roll was passed down a queue near the height of the Beatles' fame when he went to America. Passed right down, uh, the queue went right down Matthew Street, right round the corner, and there was five, maybe five, maybe half a dozen times more than we'd be able to get in the club. And I knew it was my sad duty to turn them away. But I seen them holding all sorts of objects, all depicting um, requests. And one of the most outstanding requests I ever saw that happened to get into the club, a toilet roll signed from the very beginning, unrolled, gradually went down the queue and signed by everybody just for one number. Cavern Club bouncer Patty Delaney remembers George as very caring and generous to the group's faithful fans. Uh, two girls who couldn't get in one night. Um, they were the only two that were left out in the street, and George came down as a spanking, well, new, second-hand car. We were still going around in Liverpool, and he hadn't quite reached the top. And uh, had a big night at the Cavern Club, the place was packed, these two girls were standing outside, they didn't have enough money to go in. He came down Matthew Street, and uh, I spoke to him. As he got out of the car and locked it, I walked over to him and spoke to him, and the two girls were standing there in awe of him, and um, he, he didn't say anything at that particular time. He nodded to the girls, said hello to him, the girls said hello back. He walked up to the doorway, and I stood there talking to the girls, telling them there's nothing I could do about it. I would not move from my position as a doorman, head doorman, to let them in. So um, he peeped his head out from, uh, from out the, the narrow doorway, and he beckoned me to him. So I went over to him. He said, uh, 
what's the matter with them two? I said, uh, got no money. Said, well, you haven't got quite enough. He said, oh. So he reached inside his jacket and he pulled out a pound note, which happened to be a hell of a lot in them days. And he said, uh, give that to me. Don't tell me who gave it to uh, who gave it to you. Okay. I said, well, how the hell am I going to make excuses after arguing with them for half an hour? George was never one of the Blarney or the Patter. He, he shrugged his shoulders and went downstairs. So I thought, well, I have to make up a story quick. So I went out, outside in the street and I um, went over the girls. I just kept them talking. I said, well, nothing I can do about the girls. Um, I thought I'd uh, keep it up for about another five minutes. Nothing I can do at the moment, girls. It's, uh, you know, if you haven't got the money, you're not going in. It's as simple as that. And now, don't you think you've wasted my time and your own time? So uh, I said, look, I'll stick my neck out. I'm making the sacrifice. I've got a pound here. All right. So I said, take it. Now, they weren't to be fooled. He said, uh, George gave you that, didn't he? No. What, 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 what makes you think George gave me that? Next thing. They both start sobbing their hearts out, <coughs> crying their eyes out. Uh, I said, look, there it is. Take it or leave it. Oh, he said, oh, he's wonderful. We'll pay him back. I said, yes, all right. Look, you pay me back Friday. By now, the Beatles were professional musicians. On February 21st, at lunchtime, they made their debut at the Cover Club. <laughs> February 21st, 1961 to August 3rd, 1963, the Beatles played a total of 274 gigs at the Cover Club. Loving of WGH Radio in Liverpool, England, and in the cavern right now, Louise Harrison Caldwell also here. Hello. And we have Pat Dulaney with us. Pat, about how long has this club been in existence? About six years altogether. Six years. Six years. Uh, started off uh, Liverpool uh, Cavern Jazz Club, 
And then, of course, with the uh, advent of, of jazz, rock took over, as it was then known, rock and roll. Uh, Bill Haley and the Comets made his appearance in England, and that was the inspiration to many youngsters here in this country to take over, form their own skiffle groups, and rock took over from their rock groups. And then, of course, um, we, we changed from jazz to rock. Gradually, jazz went out. We featured one jazz band instead of three or four. J featured one with three rock groups. Then after that, we um, lost jazz altogether. And of course, rock was obviously here to stay. And of course, with the rock group, you all know now that uh, the fabulous Beatles. Yes, the Beatles are originally playing here at the Cavern, now going on to about the biggest thing that has ever happened in show business. Of course, the club is still open and swinging every night, isn't it? Five nights a week, five lunch times. Uh, we uh, sometimes open over Thursday night, depending. Uh, we close normally over Thursday night, but we're open if there's a big name in town. This is a night that we can always uh, fit them in and make it a special big occasion. At the time the Beatles were playing here, it was almost an every night stint with the boys. And there was just another group here in Liverpool, but who was to know even then that they'd really hit the heights? What is the name of the group now playing here, Pat? Uh, oh, resident yeah. group at the cabin, you mean? Yes. Do they have a regular group that uh, plays here? No, not the moment. At the time of the Beatles, it was the Beatles and a group now making a big name for themselves in showbiz, the Swing and Blue Jeans. They used to be featured here resident every Tuesday and Sunday night. There's no particular resident group here at the moment, but we do feature um, regular, regularly um, the uh, Escorts, the Notions, all, the, all these two groups are up and coming. And then uh, R&B outfits such as the um, Animals, uh, the Roadrunners, and the Clayton Squares. Uh, weren't the Escorts the group that won the uh, prize? You know, when George presented the prizes at that big uh, rock and roll contest at the Liverpool Philharmonic. Uh -huh. Yeah, the Liverpool Philharmonic. That was uh, a contest featuring about 86 groups, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, seven got through, were awarded prizes. And of course, George, I think it was George and John was in the um, Thursday that night and they were asked to award these prizes. George comes on stage very, very well uh, suntanned. He just got back from um, Canary, Island. Canary Islands and uh, John was the Ringo star. George presented the uh, prizes. I made a bit of uh, clowning about on stage uh -huh. and it was a good night had by all. That was way back last May, wasn't it? Last May. Last May. Yeah, last May. And uh, that was about the time that their first album in this country became number one. Uh, please Please Me, yeah, that's yes. right, yeah. Now, that album has been number one right up until uh, the time that their second album came out. Then the second album went to number one, and their first one ever dropped to number two. And I see now that after a full year, as either number one or two on the charts that uh, their album Please Please Me has now dropped down to number four. That's after a full 12 months on the number one place or number two place. You're correct there. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a record out of the charts belonging to the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pat, I, I, I hear noises in the background like they are rebuilding the cavern. Uh, has, there, <laughs> has there been any real alteration made here? Big extensions on the way. Uh, this has been where anxiously waited for a long time and we're finally getting underway. In the last two weeks we've resumed work on alterations and have opened up next door which is identical to the cabin as you see it now. There's uh, flooring being put in, rooms which we've never had before, oh, everything. It's, I, I think it's, it'll be fantastic when it's finished. I think the deadline could be in about a month's time, the, the completion. About how many people come in each night? Oof, well, as many as we let in, and we let in about 650. I see. This place is literally uh, a basement, isn't it? It is a basement. It has been. Uh, uh, it's about 100 and odd years old. It has been um, a bacon warehouse, a wine cellar, yeah, and, now, like course, wine cellar now, and now, of course, and now, of course, the fabulous cabin. This is under what building in uh, Liverpool? This is under a um, paper warehouse, uh, boxes. You know, stack paper, you know, in general it's a paper warehouse, you know, merchandise. Ever have any people upstairs complain about the music? No, they can't hear it, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's said well, anything uh, up to now. Yeah. This, this whole um, cellar, though, is built of brick, isn't it? It's, it should be pretty solid. The, the noise shouldn't be able to get out of it, I don't think. 
Yes, well, that's what's made the cavern. Uh, the, the roundness of the ceiling and the acoustics, the sound has been so enclosed, it's been so pronounced, but it's, it's added that atmosphere to uh -huh. the cavern because the ceiling is so low, and oh, especially and when you've got people in, you, and you get groups like, um, well, nobody's like the Beatles, but you get the group like the Beatles pounding out the big beat down here. It's fantastic. Really, quite an atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Great yes. hysteria. Mm -hmm. You can probably hear somebody walking in the background now, and you can hear how it carries throughout the whole yes. room that we're in. Yeah. Uh, have you had any record companies, Pat, a approach y'all on recording a live session here? Yes, uh, Decker on an EP, which the Big Three was featured on. Incidentally, they used to be on, in the same stable, as, a, uh, as it were, w as the, uh, the Beatles and um, uh, NEMS Enterprises. And uh, they were featured on an EP called Big Three at the Cavern. That was on Decker. Then Decker moved in, I think, about two months later to record uh, an LP here, um, featuring various different groups on their books. Uh, Burn Elliot and the Fen Men, the uh, Fortunes, um, or the Big Three, and uh, many other groups that uh, they have uh, under them. And then we've also, uh, after them came Oriole, they recorded an LP here at the Cavern Club, on the same uh, basis as uh, Decker. Um, what, what are the um, refreshments served here? Do the kids, uh, can they get a drink or all something to eat? All soft drinks. and. Uh, Edible foods, of course, is um, <laughs> hot dogs, cheese rolls. Uh, can they get jam butties? <laughs> <laughs> no jam butties, girls, sorry. Um, coffee and tea, of course, you wouldn't want to know about tea. Pat Dulaney, thank you for telling Louise and myself and our WGH listeners about the fabulous and famous cavern in Liverpool, England. Thank you very much.